Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to the Kurt Schilling Baseball Show, episode 33, Double Threes. Uh, got to go in today. Some some interesting stuff to talk about, and a former teammate will be joining me uh, shortly. Jonathan Papelbon, uh, one of the probably one of the top 10 closers of all time, uh, 11th most saves of all time, but I don't know that saves are the all time metric, uh, is going to join me and we're going to chit chat. Um, I'm going to do his stats now. Um, just because I want to talk about it. And I know I, I'm always, I always, I do not like to be on the air when they're doing this stuff and I'm doing interviews. Uh, finished with a 2.44 career ERA. Put that in, putting that in perspective, Mariano Rivera, who is the greatest closer of all time, was a 2.21. Billy Wagner, 2.31. Trevor Hoffman was a 2.87. Paps ended up with a 2.44. Two uh, 368 saves, which was the 11th most all time. Uh, a walk and hit then a whip of 1.043. Mariano Vera was 1.00. Trevor Hoffman, 1.05. Whip Paps, 1.04. Six time All Star, 2007 World Champ, uh, 2007 Major League Baseball Best Pitcher, Relief Pitcher Award. Major League Record for the most consecutive scoreless innings to start a postseason career, 25. And I was there for all of them. Um, at the time he retired, he was the fastest pitcher in history. Again, the game is old. It's 100-some years old. He was the fastest pitcher in history to 200 saves uh, since been passed by Craig Kimbrell. Uh, th this one's the best stat of all, though. He is the all-time saves leader for the Philadelphia Phillies and the Boston Red Sox, which means two of the oldest franchises in the game he is the all-time saves leader for, and that's that's something else. Uh, 2006 AL Rookie of the Year runner-up lost to Justin Verlander. Um, but he's going to join me after uh, in a bit, and we're going to talk and have some fun and some laughs. So um, we're going to start off, though, with me ripping a member of the media, which is always enjoyable, uh, especially when it's someone who never had a jock strap on in their lives. Uh, New York sports radio host Evan Roberts, who's a Mets fan, I guess, and a Jets fan, which explains his misery. Here's the quote. Quote, the Mets spend $90 million on these two mercenary pieces of crap, Scherzer and Verlander, who've done nothing. Max Scherzer's pretended to do something because his overall numbers are good and he's had some really good starts. But think about what he did last year. A little later on, Max Scherzer pitched well, missed a big chunk of time. And then when they needed him most against the Braves and then in the playoffs against the Padres, he wasn't bad. He was awful. Uh, social media went nuts and was ripping him. But you know what? Um People wonder why athletes uh, do the things they do with the media. That's one of the reasons why. Because Evan Roberts, I would, I, I, I'm not gonna. I, I, I could be wrong, uh, but I don't think it's a big stretch to say that he hasn't stepped foot in the Mets clubhouse uh, and doesn't. He's one of those those cowards that sits in uh, behind a mic, talks trash, and never confronts a player to 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 say or do anything. Um, but. Uh, Bill, you, you wanted to know a couple things, um, and, and I think they're interesting topics to look at. Is Scherzer done? No. No, he's struggling, um, and, and as is Verlander. Um, they aren't the pitchers they once were. They're still very, very good, and I would argue that the Mets are where they are. These two guys, I think, will end up where they're supposed to be at the end of the year, and that's to say they'll have lower ERAs, they'll win more than they lose, and they'll have good all peripheral stats. So there's winning in front of the Mets. These guys are gonna gonna get good. That that neither one and you know neither one is hurt. Um, so I, I think he'll be fine. Does it matter in the clubhouse? Absolutely not. The only thing this does is is in sometimes it, it'll fire a player up, but generally they don't care enough about guys like Evan Roberts's opinions um, to, to to matter. You know, um, Buck will use it however he needs to use it in that clubhouse. I do know that. Um, how much attention is paid to the media and sports radio on a team level, almost none, unless you have bulletin board material on a personal level, it's intense. Everybody listens and watches and people that say they don't lie, uh, because your entire circle, uh, reminds you or lets you know, every time somebody says something about you on any station anywhere, um, and then I would say, like I said, uh, if I'm the Mets fan, I'm okay with it because I know they're going to – I still believe they're good enough to be where they've always been at the end of the year. They'll be good. Their numbers will be good. So the Mets will win more than they lose. 
excuse me, and let's remember that it's a cre- an incredibly talented team, but they need to, you know, Pete Alonso's out because I don't think Charlie Morton meant to hit him, but, uh, uh, and, and as a Christian, I always say this very lightly, the baseball gods um, are, are in some sense real and that karma always plays in the game. So, uh, I, you know, keep your mouth shut and win. That that then you can do all the stuff you want to do. Um, gonna head out to the left coast, and uh, I, I hate to say it like this, but it, it it's true. Um, uh, it wasn't baseball anyway. Uh, Oakland, uh, ha, uh, the Oakland A's have the worst fans in baseball. They are by far the, they didn't show up. They never supported the team uh, after the seventies, um, and they did. They had every right to 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 do what they did and act like they did. But Oakland is a, is a city that, that you have to go there to understand uh, how bad it really is. Um, but being in Oakland, their fans in, in, and again, I, not all of them, there was a hard, there's a hardcore, um, their average attendance of 8,555 would be the number. There's 8,555 really good baseball fans in Oakland. Um, but they did a reverse boycott. And basically what that is, instead of boycotting the stadium, they were all going to show up and try and get the, and, and, and protest. They want ownership to sell the team and keep the team in Oakland. Uh, and a whole 27,000 of them showed up. 27,759 showed up for the reverse boycott, which probably, well, it was their largest crowd of the season uh, and more than triple their attendance. It probably, I, this, I promise you the stadium look, still look half empty. It's a massive stadium, <laughs> um, but they need to move. Uh, they need to move and they need to move soon because those 8,555 hardcore fans are just not enough uh, in this day and age. Uh, but two hours before the game, the A's had announced that they were donating all the ticket revenue from the game to the Alameda County Food Bank and the Oakland Public Education Fund. Oh, that seems like an awesome thing. What a, what a, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, benevolent thing benevolent, to do? What a benevolent act. And, and, uh, uh, but there's always a reason, isn't there? Um, come to find out that one of the sticking points with the Nevada deliberations, so they, Nevada just voted um, and approved a $380 million uh, bond for public money in Vegas for the ballpark. Uh, one of the sticking points during the vote was uh, the team's commitment to the community, which was deemed inadequate by several opponents. So a one-day quick fix and, and all is well. So there you go. Um, the A's beat Tampa which was their seventh straight, which is pretty much like half their wins this year. I think they had 19 coming into today, 18 or 19. The only no, the, the Royals are now worse than they are, so baseball can't be fun in either city. And Kansas City is a great baseball town um, that has been screwed by a horrible, horrible ownership for a long, long time. Um, the A's winning percentage going into the streak was 194. Yeah, one nine, their, their team winning streak was below the Mendoza line. So, um it's their longest winning streak uh, by a team with a sub 200 winning percentage with t- more than 25 games into the season. <laughs> what other teams do they tie? The 1895 Louisville Cardinals and the 1885 Detroit Wolverines. And I think Nolan Ryan started a game for one of those guys. <laughs> um, making the streak all the more impressive is that all seven victories have come against teams above 500. And that is actually impressive. Bill, we're going to harp back to the beginning of the year. We talked about the Diamondbacks. You have to love this team. They're real. It's June. They're real, guys. Uh, they're 20-7 and seven since the 12th. They lost last night, which snapped a six-game winning streak. Uh, lost to the Phillies in 10 for three. They have a three-game lead in the West. The AL, NL Rookie of the Year, and I believe will probably be in the top five in the MVP votes, Corbin Carroll. Um, over his past 27 games, is hitting 324. Uh, his slash line is 324, 417, 657 for us, uh, an OPS of 1072, guys. You know, he leads the league in OPS. Oh, yeah. No, this is he's real. His story's real. We said at the beginning of the year, he's a baseball player. Um, the seven games that they've lost in that 27 game stretch, he's five for 25, hitting 200. Um, and here's the here's the upside if you're if you're the glass half full guy like I am in the 27 games their rotation has had an ERA of three nine 
um, which is much better than the 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 four eight ERA they had over the thirty eight games. You know, my response to that is Zach Allen's real, my, but my response to that would be they're going to be better than that as they move forward. Or your response could be they're going to regress to the mean and be who they are, and they're not going to be as good moving forward. But I still believe I don't know that they'll win the division. Um, but they'll be in the postseason, barring a massive collapse. And I don't see it happen unless they get hurt. Um, yeah, they need to stay, especially their arms need to stay healthy. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I always, my, the, the number, the stat I always used to use, and I believe to this day is true, is when you, when you break camp, the teams that get the most starting, the most innings from their starting rotation that breaks camp in spring training will end up being at the top of the division. Um, and, and that proves to be true almost every year. Staying out in the West, though, uh, Keaton Wynn, a rookie for the Giants, became the first rookie in San Francisco history, in Giants history, uh, to become to record a save in his Major League debut. Um, that's First of all, the Giants are a forever franchise, right? I mean, they came from, from Brooklyn and, and – or uh, from uh, New York and um, – Great fan base, by the way. Um, even though it is probably the most woke city in, on the planet, um, they're great baseball fans. Um, somebody, uh, uh, Bill, you wanted to know why? Why would this be the first time? Um, that's just not something you do. You have to have a guy. You have to be a little different makeup. And and when we get to talking to Pap, you'll understand what I mean by that. Um, being closing is hard, but you definitely don't put that on the shoulders of a young player that you're not sure can handle it. Because blowing a save is the worst experience in the world. Um, it, will it be a copycat thing? No. Nah, there's first of all, there's not enough. There's not enough arms going around like that to to do something like that. And then, um, it's just not something you do. There's no upside to that because it's um, well. And and you'll hear Pap Pap came to the big leagues as a starter, uh, and I thought was going to be. Uh, a, a very good starter and, and moved to the pen and, and wrote, wrote the record books in, in a lot of different ways, but you just don't do it. There's no upside. The downside is catastrophic because blowing a save is one of the worst experiences you can have as a pitcher. And you don't want to throw that on a kid in his first big league game and have him suck on that for, for a couple of days. Joining me now is uh, a young man. I say young man, cause everybody's young man to me now. Uh, a kid who I watched <laughs> from beginning to end, uh, a guy who at the time, and I'm going to, I'm uh, is Jonathan Papelbon joining me. Hey, what's up, Pap? How you doing, buddy? What's up, Uncle Shill, man? I miss you, brother. I, I miss you as well. I'm going to tell you a quick story. So uh, for the, I, 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 you guys heard me talk about his statistics at the beginning and where they rank all time, which is, is stinking unbelievable. But Pap, I remember uh, right after you made the transition to the bullpen and you had started to close and, and the numbers were starting to pile up and you know, I was always one to like study. I couldn't figure things out. I wanted to figure them out and I couldn't figure out why, because you didn't throw 99. You were a low to mid nineties guy with a nasty split, but your swing and miss rate was through the roof. And I couldn't figure it out. I'm like, he's not throwing hard. His ball's not moving a lot. So I went to a very, very good hitter on another team. And I said, you got to tell me, dude, what the hell? Why can't you guys make contact? And it wasn't like a jealous thing. It was like, I need to know. And I didn't realize and I, I realized after this, because I went back and watched the video, they said the problem at, in Boston, number one, is your white jerseys, his hand and arm comes out of his jersey. The ball comes out of his jersey, and I can't pick it up. And I thought, wow, because I thought you were more of an over-the-top guy, but the you shot the ball almost, in a sense, through the throwing zone. And so I talked to a couple of hitters, and they all said the same thing. The ball was so hard to pick up out of your hand that they had to they they reacted to your 93 because I always say all fastballs are not equal right some guys 93 looks 98 some guys 93 looks 89 um and you were that guy right you were that guy who had the 93 that looked 99 did you know that I did Shil. you know like okay so I love that you know God God did not make, create all fastballs equal right fact so um to me you know, and I was a study guy too, but you know, in my role, I didn't, I didn't overanalyze. I, right. I kind of went with just straight hardcore facts and, and, and stuff like that. So, um, and, and, and for me, I had more down and then drive. And that's why the ball kind of shot out 
I tried to hide the ball as long as I can, right. as long as I can, and bam, yeah, uh, release. But you know, shoot, chill. We didn't. I always admired the way you backspin the ball. I love the way guys could spin balls, and now it's the spin rate is yeah. just going through the roof. Yeah. So, um, yeah. to me, it was all about you know how you can manip manipulate the baseball. I didn't care how hard you threw. So, so for those of you guys that don't know, Paps came up to uh, he was a hype prospect in Boston. I remember the discussion around it, uh, but you know, I was kind of partial to him because he was going to be in my rotation. Uh, he was going to be one of my four other starters and and uh, all the things that go with that. He comes to the big leagues. Uh, and in my mind, yes, everything about him was was a starter's makeup. The third pitch thing he was working on, but he had he had a two pitch combo in, with the fastball and the split that that were well, they were what they Yo, were. Can I interrupt you real quick? Yeah. All right. So, yeah, well, you, you need to let people understand this because I, I've said this for a long time, you know. And I don't know if you remember this. I was in like double A and they invited me to spring training. You showed me the split. And to me, that was like, okay, man, these guys are taking me under their wings. And, um, you know, I, I'm going to try to emulate them and, and get up there and be with them and go try to win a championship. So yeah. I wouldn't have got there without that split. So well, it, it's, and it, you know, it, it, I appreciate that. Um, but, I, you know, I always say the same thing. You know, I can show you any, any, everything I in the world. It doesn't matter if you, if you don't have the baseball IQ to understand it. And if you don't have the ability to take it and use it for you, not don't do it like me, take my part and make it yours. That's what I did. My entire program was a combination of every pitcher I ever talked to and met young and old. You know, I wanted to find out because I didn't want to get to the big leagues. I want to be better than everybody in the world. Right, so and I didn't, you, I, were your own, you you were your own pitching coach. I, right, I noticed, and, and, that. Right. I noticed and, that very early. Well, and it was also I, I was also incredibly coachable in the sense that I was always listening and talking pitching. So I wanted to know, I wanted to know how Maddox did it, how Bly Levin did it, how Jim Palmer did it, how Seaver and Ryan and all those guys. And I took all little bits of pieces of all those things and melded them into what made Kurt Schilling go, which was the preparation and the video. But anyway, you come to the big leagues, you're, you're a starter. And I'm, I'm partial to that. I'm thinking, because I remember meeting you in double a, and I, I was a guy who had a couple guys when I was young. Cause I, you know, you came up kind of in the last group of guys where you kept your mouth shut in the locker room and, and you listened and you did your job and you earned your way into the, you were on the roster, but you earned your way up the roster by performing and being quiet. And in Boston, if you're not, it, it can generally be a problem because the media is full of a bunch of idiots and and, and douches and, and all the things that go with that. You come up and pitch, you're you're a starter out of the out of the minor leagues. And I mean, physically you had all the things, right? You had the body for it, you had the mechanics for it. Um, you know, getting that third pitch was was the thing I think was which would everybody would say, okay, when he masters that third pitch and gets that, whatever that is, um, you move to the bullpen. And you clearly, I mean, like I said, I, I did it, tried it, couldn't do it. Couldn't handle a blown save. I couldn't. I couldn't deal with a blown save. It's the worst feeling on the planet. Right, so no. here, you can't deal with that, though, Shield. I couldn't. Look, I, trust me, man. I I, I thought I was going to be a star, too, until I got to, I, I got there, and I start. I, I can't sit for five days, man. That's right. nuts. Right, right. Now, I was the other way around, like, I, 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 I was, I was uh, a hyperactive and ADHD and all those things, but I, 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 what I did was I went to video and preparation, right? I spent that four days getting ready. Um, but I love the ability. I loved when I was, when I was younger and I did it, I loved showing up at the ballpark every day, knowing that I was going to pitch that night. That was fun. Yeah. I liked that. And yeah. that was the attraction of the bullpen. But what, when you go to the bullpen, Things change, right? You're not having to prepare to get a guy out three times. You're having to prepare to get three outs in the ninth inning, the three highest leverage outs of the game for the most part. Um, how did you make that transition mentally? I know physically you just made yourself kind of a two-and-a-half pitch pitcher. You were fastball split. You dump a breaking ball in every now oh, and then. Better. Right, right. But 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 how did you make that transition from an approach perspective? And then from a from a, like you said, from sitting four days in a row to pitching to being available every day. How was well, that transition for you? Okay. So I go, it was too, it wasn't the easiest thing. You know, I went to the uh, triple A, I think for a couple of weeks and, and did and I right. came back. But I will say this. I don't know if you remember him, Gary Tuck. Oh yeah. I remember Tucker. Yeah. So Tuck was with Mo for all those years. At the chance, And then he came to us and I was like, Holy man, I have the opportunity of a lifetime. Right. Yep. 
this guy, just my idol was Mo at that point. And um, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to try to. So I went to him and I said, hey, look, I, I want to be an everyday player. I, I want to feel like an everyday player. I don't give a I went out and drank five bottles of wine the night before. I got to get ready for tonight, right? I want to be an everyday guy. And so he kind of started coaching me into like what a routine meant, what um, how, how I – prepared every day did know? he did he say you know this is what mariano did this he is what did Mar he yeah did. good no i think that's great yeah he did and he would and of course i you know every day i'm asking right. questions about mariano right, right. And eventually he was like you know enough is enough like right <laughs> but and, you know tuck was always grumpy he was always a right. grumpy guy yep and so um real salty and so you know um i basically just like you were saying earlier, I took bits and pieces from, from him and incorporated into my own game, became my own pitching coach and said, this is how I'm going to prepare every night. And this is what I want to do. And this is how I'm going to be able to do it for a long, long time. So, yeah, I got to tell you a couple things early in your career, you offended New York, which is awesome by saying that you wanted to break Rivera's record, which I thought was awesome in, in the sense that, you know, you, you go back and say, well, I probably shouldn't have said that when I said it, but, but for me, I know, but for me, it was, I like the fact that I'm playing with a guy who believes he can be better than everybody else. And I was taken aback and stunned, not by the numbers, more I, the consistency for me. Your consistency was what, uh, to me, what made you, you know, the best closer I ever pitched in front of. Um, and then in the postseason, taking it to another level, which you did. Um, but in, in in and I find a lot, and if I go back in my career, go back to your the beginning of your career in the bullpen, and for your career in the bullpen. So, by the way, folks, Gary Tuck was a bullpen coach for us, who was in uh, with the Yankees with Mariano, came over was a bullpen coach of the Red Sox, who and people don't understand how influential and important those guys are. They're every bit as important as the head coach when it comes to your bullpen, your relievers, and the relievers it's down right. there. But when you talk to me about being in the bullpen, who were the two or three guys over your career? that were most influential on you as pitchers in the bullpen, because you guys sit down there for, and you know, you wouldn't come down to, I don't remember sixth or seventh inning or whatever, but, but when you sat down the, who were the guys that, that, that you really became better because of their presence? Okay. Well, two guys really, and, and, and for me, uh, you know, talking just strictly bullpen guys, um, believe it or not, were Gagne I mean, what, what Gagne taught me a lot about like longevity and like mistakes in life, how to get through like more life than any. Right. I I don't know, man. People don't remember. He came to us at the end of his career. Uh, I got to see him when he was in his prime, and he was the most dominating pitcher I ever seen in my life. He had five wipeout pitches, unbelievable, uh, and and was doing. He did things with the baseball I've never seen anybody do. But he was with us for a brief period in in uh, in Boston, and uh, I didn't realize that. I, that's great to hear, though, because I loved him. He was a great dude. Yeah, he was a great guy, and um, you know, he he came to us and. Um, you know, I'll, I'll never forget it. You know, he, he called me up before he came. He said, Pap, you're going to close here. I want to set you up. And um, I'm on the tail end of my career. We had a good talk with Theo. And it, it was, and to me, I learned the business then. And, and it helped me on my way out, too. Uh, when I got old and was like, okay, it's time to turn the ball over. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, even speaking earlier, when I made that comment in New York, um, you know, I had always been like that. And, and what was funny is, is, is um, we had this camp in uh, big league camp, at, like for some of the prospects and Theo made us write down what we thought we were going to do our career. And I said, well, I'm going to be in the Hall of Fame, Theo. I don't need to write I'm in the Hall of Fame. Well, you know, I, yeah. I fell a little short of it, but. Well, uh, but yeah, no, it, but, but you wouldn't have been the player you were without that mentality. Correct, correct. Yeah. And, and, and I, that, I think that's, that, that gets lost a lot today. Right. It really well, does. I'll tell you what does get lost. Things get lost because the media doesn't and the fans don't understand the lives we live. And I'm not saying it's hardship, but it's so different than what they think it is. And I'll use an example. When you were in Washington and you and Bryce got into it, and, I, and, and the media, that was like everywhere forever. And people were asking me, I said, you, you, I'm not sure you people understand. 
that happens like three times a week. Most of the time it happens Yo, behind the scenes. You know how many times tech would whoop my ass? Oh, no, and, and, but I know. And I was on the other end of that as well. But I was on both ends of that. The, yeah. the, the thing so, that but, they, but see, but see sure, here's the thing, though, too, is, is, is you know how player-only meetings are. We had many of those about our manager at the time, about the general man, about, you know, everything included. I went there. We were up three games. Now, all of a sudden, we're down three games, and it's end of September – and, um, you know, yeah. we had a lot – like, there was there, there was a lot of things that went on that said, okay, all right, guys, we're going to start running the bases right. We're going to start <laughs> pitching with authority and, and command right. the strike zone. We're not going to – like, we got to get back. Right. All these things in an hour-long team meeting. Well, I mean, then the very next day we go out and we do the same <laughs> And then it's like over and over. And so right. the things explode, and, and it happens yeah. – Field. You know, me and Bryce yeah. are great today. Man. Um, yeah. Well, and I, I mean, I, I love you both. I love him. I'm, I've only met him a couple times, but I love the hell out of him. He's a pro. He plays hard and all the things that he does. 100 leader now. I mean, like you, like, and that's the thing is people don't understand is we go through these things in life, man, yeah. that that either take us to or away from God, that take us to or away from the fans and for our families yeah. and all our teammates and brotherhoods and all this bullshit, yeah. and it, it makes you who you are. So, well, I mean, and that's the other thing too. It's funny because. You know, you and I haven't talked in a long time, but the game, people don't understand, you know, why don't you stay in touch with all the people? Well, I played with that, a thousand players. There's only 24 hours in a day. You keep in touch with the people that you can keep in touch with. But yeah. when we get in the same room, it's like we were here yesterday. Yeah, because, because we lived together. We, we, we went through ups and downs together. Um, you know, I, I, I always tell people one of the things I, so, so one of the, I, I mean, and I, I was, in that on that Red Sox franchise, I almost I got in the fight with Manny, I think three different times. Um oh, yeah. and and, yeah. and but but that's the the day-to-day -day life of a I think it's the hardest schedule in sports by a long shot. No um you know, maybe not the most physically demanding sport, but the hardest schedule by far because you know, and Deion Sanders and Brian Jordan both said that the hardest schedule the baseball was way harder than the NFL because Sunday night you might bang up your hammy, but Monday you got John Schmoltz. You know, yeah. so yeah, but so talk to me about. When did you realize that you were on the backside? When did you realize it, it was you were done? That it was you, well, you had enough? That's a great question, Shill, because so a lot of times you don't realize it. But um, <clears throat> you know, I read this book, and it was about the game of baseball. And throughout your entire career, it um, you feel like you have a hold on that baseball, right? And you are throwing the baseball and you're in control of that baseball. And when you put the game down, you, you, you kind of realize that you, that baseball had a grip on you. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't have a grip on that baseball. So, yeah. um, you know, I realized it when I showed up, uh, and it started showing up in Washington when I had losing seasons and everybody around me wasn't motivated. Um, and I started, it started to feel like a job. Yeah. And so for me, you know, I could have gone back and played and, and made you know three or 4 million here or there. But to me, I was never going to play this game if my heart wasn't in it. It wasn't in it. Right. I could have grinded it out, but man, well, I really, truly, I needed to, you know, I needed to come home and I needed to like, you know, just, I, I was done with it. I just, there were so many things in well, my Well, you life. also got lucky. You, like me, you married an amazing woman. And, yeah. uh, and you, I know you, you grew up in a close family and you wanted a family and all the things that went with that. You know, I, 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 I gotta tell you, and I, I'm going to ask you this question, but everybody asked me and my answer is the same. I have never missed the game for one minute since I left you. No, no. No, you never will. No. And, 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 like, here's the thing is, is, like, everybody that we've played with, won championships with or anything, you know, you have your core families. And, and guys go through divorces and guys go through this and that life after this. But, like, when there's family involved, like, cancers or, you know, what your family's been through, what Tim Wakefield is going through right now. I mean, yeah. you know, and it's like, hey, I'm here for you, Tim. You know, like, yep. Christmas cards or whatever it may be. Yeah, man. That that never leaves, and so no. It, well, I think it it becomes obvious when we get into a room after being apart for twenty years, and we're all talking like we were there yesterday. Yeah, dude. I think that that's the gift that the game gave me. I I, I 
And I realized for me, I was telling, I realized that when, after I had my surgery and I, I threw my last bullpen and I hit 94 on the gun and I said, I'm done because yeah. I knew I didn't have the love of the game to put the work in, in the winter time. It was never the game. It was always, it was always the work and effort yeah. needed to get ready. Yeah. And, and it so feel like work, man, it no. started to feel like hey, work. let me ask you something. If you, if you had to look back on your career and, and, and this is not a trick question, I'm not looking for an, I'm looking for a true answer. Cause most, many people don't any regrets. Oh yeah. Really? Like what? Uh, um, I, I would say most of my regrets would have been, I, I wish I would have went to bed earlier a lot of nights. Yeah. Uh, I wish I would have taken care of myself better. I wish I uh, could have been with my family more. I wish I could, man, uh, chill. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. Look, I got a ton of regrets, yeah. but I don't live my life now. No, no, no. Every day. No, and, and you know what? The other thing too is, it, you know, a lot of the things that you, you think you regret, you end up realizing again, you probably wouldn't have been the guy you were, the player you were, if you hadn't done the things you did, that was who you were. And that was how you were made. And, yeah. you know, I, I played with some guys who are in the hall of fame who drank harder than anybody I've ever seen in any phase of life ever. And they showed up every day and played. And, and that was just how they did. You had to live a different life. I'm still a night owl. I mean, yeah. the, the baseball schedule, I, I never adapted to being a morning person because as a baseball player, you didn't, that wasn't what you did. And I did it for 20 years. And you know what, Shil, I, I man, I can relate to you so hardcore on that, man. Um, yeah, it, it's, yeah. you know, I told my son one day, I said, man, you, you be you. Just like when I was coming up there, there, you know, all the comparisons to, to me, to you, to me, to Roger, to, you know, just to the right-handed power pitch. And yeah. I'm like, man, I'm just trying to be me, dude. Yeah. Yeah, that well, I mean, sports is always going to be that way. The expectation game, oh, yeah. uh, it's it, you know, everybody talks about well, you got to stop hyping these people, and every year it gets worse. So, yeah. hey, Pat, listen, buddy, it was always it's it's great to see you, great to hear you. Please tell Ashley I said love hello, you, I love you guys, love you, man, and I appreciate you taking the time, buddy. You take care, God bless, and uh, we'll talk again. I'll, I'll give you a holler, we'll talk soon, yeah, man. I'll be around, all right, see you, buddy. Take care, bub. All right, that was awesome. Um, and, and I got to tell you guys that that's generally for the most part, how all players are after they retire. We, we have, I haven't talked to Pap in 10 years. Um, but you wouldn't, I don't think you'd have known it from that conversation. Um, good to see he's doing well. And, uh, and truly, if you go back and take the numbers, one of the historically good closes in the last 40, 50 years. So thanks to Pap, uh, and his lovely wife, Ashley and their kids, um, Outkick.com, go over to the right side, click on shows, Kurt Schilling Baseball Show. You can also find us on Spotify. Bill, have a great weekend. I will catch up with you on Tuesday of next week, buddy.